Hello, uh, Tracy Mears. Uh, welcome to The Glenn Show. This is Glenn Lowry at Brown University and Blogging Heads, uh, talking with Tracy Mears of the Yale uh, Law School, a scholar who's done extensive writing and research on police community relations and con crime control and race and uh, so on. And so it's really a delight to be able to talk to you, Tracy. Good afternoon, Glenn. It's nice to talk to you again, too. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing with the audience. Okay, so now we've known each other for a long time, uh, but I don't know if everybody uh, out there knows how deeply involved you've been, I mean, for years and years now in on the ground research on police community relations and crime control in communities of color. Uh, do you want to just uh, sort of say a little bit about, you know, sort of what you do before we get on to talking about the issue at hand with your courses in the aftermath of Ferguson, Missouri, and uh, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, and uh, uh, other cases of that, that sort that, uh, you know, all of this controversy has risen about police and so on. And I want to talk in detail about recent events, but maybe you can just get us started by saying a little bit about your general research program in this area and, uh, you know, whatever other thoughts you might have about that. Sure. Um, I'd say you're right. We have known each other a long time. And what I was working on when we first met was trying to understand better the nature of crime and violence in urban communities, particularly disadvantaged, um, predominantly minority urban communities, um, trying to bring sociological insights um, to the study of uh, the construction of legal policy with respect uh, to those issues. Um, at the time that I started, which is, you know, in 1995, so a really long time ago now, yeah. um, th there was a, a sense that you know, the right way to address crime policy was um, really to be tough on crime. Sure, there's uh, still uh, vestiges of, of that left too, but people didn't have a, a deep understanding of the ways in which our crime policy could actually be criminogenic. Um, also, there was a, a gap in the legal literature about the role of community in developing these strategies. So. Um, law professors tended to look at issues from the perspective of the criminal defendant um, and maybe the victim. But um, those who were, who were obviously connected to, uh, to uh, criminal uh, offenders and to victims, but not necessarily occupying either one of those roles, were often ignored yeah. in, in legal analysis. And um, I tried to play a role in, in that. And, and doing that work, uh, thought a lot about work by sociologists like William Julius Wilson and Rob Sampson, you know, who have advanced the study of neighborhoods greatly. But then um, I turned to uh, looking at the social psychology of compliance and how people think about understanding the ways in which uh, legal authorities are fair. And it's that work that led me to my current interest in um, policing. Okay, so how crime, one of the themes is how crime control strategies can uh, end up being criminogenic, meaning that can end up actually promoting more crime rather than preventing or deterring it. Um, exactly. And, and a big emphasis on the role that uh, the structure of social relationships in neighborhoods and communities place in the process of criminal behavior and the control of criminal behavior. Right. So, so what about this criminogenic point? That's a little bit counterintuitive, you know, that uh, the effort to control crime might actually promote crime. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure um, I get exactly how that mechanism works. Right. Well, that insight comes from um, a couple of sociologists who were writing in the 30s, uh, Clifford Shaw and Henry McKay. And one of the things that they were trying to do was to document how the patterns of crime and high crime neighborhoods and cities, they were working primarily in Chicago at the time. And what they noted when they started documenting these crime patterns was that the same neighborhoods exhibited high rates of crime over time, no matter who lived there. And 
this was uh, an interesting finding at the time because the theories of, of criminal offending at the time um, focused uh, on things like um, ethnicity, race. Um, sometimes people even, you know, counted uh, dents and knobs in, in cranial structure. I mean, you know, it was all yeah. about the kind of person um, who was committing the the offenses. And Sean McKay said, well, wait a minute. If the same places are demonstrating high rates of crime over time, no matter who lives there, and we know that different groups of people are living there, and then it's got to be something about the place and not about the people um, that is contributing to these high rates of crime. So they developed a theory called the social disorganization theory, which has been updated by sociologists, as I said, like uh, Rob Sampson, Robert Bursick, others, um, to show about the, the ways in which people are connected to each other and organized in place can either promote or um, dampen crime. So you look for um, patterns of collective efficacy, um, the ways in which people use their social capital to advance their goals and projects, and it turns out that when you do law enforcement as usual, that is, uh, you know, arresting, convicting, removing many people from uh, particular places in large amounts, you know, large numbers of people, yep. you actually, uh, you know, make the a fragile structure even more fragile. You deteriorate it, make it more difficult for the people who live there to uh, be able to exert social control. Why is it that? taking people who are disturbing uh, the social peace out of the community, a contributing factor to, um, you know, undermining the ability to maintain social control. I should have thought it would be a positive yeah. factor. Yeah, it isn't, um, it's not necessary that removal uh, will lead to this uh, automatically. Uh, it is, you know, it's an intuitive, it's intuitive, you can intuit, as you are, that, um, you know, some people um, are, it's useful uh, for them to be removed from the community. Um, but I, I think it's just the scale um, that, that <coughs> disturbs, that disturbs these structures. Um, there, I, I think that's where the war on drugs plays a role. Um, you know, if a person isn't particularly dangerous, but is also actually contributing something to the community in terms of guardianship, in terms of parenthood, uh, in terms of parenting, um, then, you know, those kinds of positive inputs are also taken away. Also, when you uh, send people far away to prison, you uh, impact the resources of the family. People spend yeah. time in visiting their loved ones, in prison, and they can't uh, contribute to their communities in, in another way. So you're right; it's not a foregone conclusion. But there's a good deal of research out now showing the ways in which the massive numbers that uh, that of, of, of people who have been removed, and uh, probably in connection with the numbers, the kinds of offenses that they're being sent to prison for, um, is detrimental. Yeah, okay, so a major intellectual um, contribution, it seems to me, of this way of thinking might be the distinction between seeing criminal offending as the manifestation of individual characteristics of low intelligence or uh, temperament, uh, a lack of ability to control emotion, um, predisposition to violence that might operate through some kind of psychological or even, you know, um, physical, physiological processes. The distinction between that on the one hand and criminal offending emerging from a complex social interaction uh, model where the structure of community, the nature of relationships, the, 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 the character of, of the ability of people to informally influence others' behaviors through the granting or withholding of social approval uh, is the oper operational um, mechanism. Um, does that seem correct to say? Yeah, um, so if I followed everything that you said, the thing is, is What's really interesting about this work is that if you're thinking about legal policy, so I'm just going to shift um, uh, my answer to your question a bit. If you're thinking about legal policy, that it's important to think about multiple levels. So what Sean McKay were doing was trying to understand 
um, crime rates in places over time. They weren't actually trying to explain um, what, how a particular individual goes about thinking about compliance or not. Yeah. Right? And, it, and it's because of that distinction that I started looking at the social psychology of legitimacy because, um, you know, what the sociological uh, research tells you is that there are certain kinds of uh, criminal law policies that are going to predictively, at a macro level, um, impact a community's ability to keep itself safe. And then the question is, all right, if you're actually thinking about what particular individuals are doing and how to motivate them to comply, you know, I think that that research has less to say about that question. Um, and the social psychology of legitimacy has much more to say about that question. And that research offers a critique of the individual level, um, individual level theories that motivate those broader strategies that lead to the problem that I just described, right? So the social psychology of legitimacy offers a critique of, let's say, deterrence that has a particular assumption about why people comply. And when law enforcers heavily invest in deterrent strategies, arresting, convicting lots of people for low-level drug crimes and sending them to prison for a long time, right? The, the sociological theory has a critique of that at a macro scale and the social psychology of, of legitimacy as a critique of it at an individual level. Does that answer make sense? Yeah, I, it, it sort of makes sense. Okay, at the individual level, the critique would be that these particular individual having less respect for or investing less legitimacy in the institutions of law and order is more likely than otherwise would be the case to offend. Um, yes. And and the macro the macro level uh, processes are what that's that's what I'm not quite getting. Right. The macro level processes are that when you have a strategy that um, you know, discourages people from complying voluntarily, you know, because it lacks legitimacy, and the consequences of that strategy are such that many many people are removed from the community for long periods of time. Okay. And when they come back, you know, they essentially have an economic death sentence. They're scarred. They can't, yeah. Right? So, yeah. And, and that's bad in the long run for the maintenance of uh, security and order in such communities. And social control. Exactly. Okay. So, um, what does this mean practically in terms of how one polices a city, New York City or Chicago? I know a lot of the work that you were just talking about that William Julius Wilson and Rob Sampson have done over the years has been based on careful study of Chicago neighborhoods. And I gather that mm -hmm. you too, in your own research, have based some of your work in place on the observations you've made in the city of Chicago. We hear about all the murders of young kids in Chicago and the various problems that some of those neighborhoods have been experiencing. And I'm just wondering on the basis of your research and insights, what implications for uh, criminal justice policy and policing practice uh, flow uh, from this way of looking at things uh, in the context of, for example, a place like Chicago? Yeah, well, let's take, um, let's take the, the sociological work first and then work backwards to police legitimacy. So I think the primary insight um, of the sociological work is that um, prison should be used carefully. <laughs> Um, you know, not that it's bad to use it. I mean, you know, people who harm others should be held accountable. We should think carefully, though, about how long uh, we take people away from the community and when they come back. We should think about the ways in which we re reintegrate them and so on and so forth. So that's, you know, one insight. You know, a second insight turning to the social psychology is that um, to the extent possible, the state should invest in ways to promote, you know, legitimacy in, uh, among, uh, or perceptions of legitimacy among the polity. So I should say what that means because we haven't really talked about that. Okay. Um, so what it means is, I, the easiest way to think about it is to compare and contrast three different ways of thinking about why people obey the law. Right? So you say... One way of thinking about why people obey the law is to say, 
they obey because they fear the consequences of failing to do so. That's yes. the standard deterrence account. Another way of thinking about it is they fear the, uh, that they obey the law because they think it's the right thing to do. You know, we might just call that basic morality. Right. Um, a third way of thinking about it is to say that people obey because they think that government has the right to dictate to them proper behavior. Now, when I say legitimacy, that is what I'm talking about. Now, research shows, um, decades of research actually, that this latter category, people complying because they think government has the right to dictate to them proper behavior, is a much more powerful motivator of compliance than is deterrence. Um, people obeying because they think it's the right thing to do is by far the most important. I don't want to <laughs> short circuit that one. Okay. Um, but um, that particular factor is hard sometimes for government to be involved in. They're the obvious ones where they're all three in one. You know, like people think that it's wrong to murder people. Um, and government doesn't want you to murder people and so on and so forth. But there are often things that government wants you to do that you actually disagree with. Right? Indeed. And in that, <laughs> so, I can think and of that, a few of those. I won't mention yeah. them, but never mind. <laughs> so in that case, you got to rely on something else. Um, in that case, we're relying either on you complying because you fear the consequences of failing to do so, or because you think government has the right to dictate to you proper behavior. And what the social psychologists have shown us is that um, there are four factors that matter a lot in promoting legitimacy. One is um, that people are treated with dignity and respect. Another factor is that people are given, like in an individual encounter, a chance to tell their side of the story, let's say with a police officer. I think we'll probably talk about that in a second. Yeah. But it also can generalize. So if you're thinking about legal policies or strategies, people want an opportunity to participate, you know, to, to have something to say. It's called voice. A third factor that matters a lot is um, indications of fair decision making. So again, let me take a, a police encounter. Does a police officer tell you why um, that officer is stopping you when they pull you over uh, on the side of the road, or do they just do you know do uh, yeah. do as I say, not as I do think? Um, but there are all sorts of other factors that give people indications of, of fair decision making. And the fourth factor, um, which I think is definitely relevant to the recent incidents in um, in Ferguson and in New York, is is some thing we call an expectation of benevolence and, and trust in um, the kind of uh, normative alignment uh, with legal authorities and you know I can say more about that it's it's easier to talk about with example than it is to, to just use words but these four factors matter a lot um, and notice what I didn't say you know, what doesn't seem to matter that much to people is whether the outcome of a particular encounter favors them. Well, um, what doesn't seem to matter to people as much in assessing whether legal authorities are fair, how effective they are. So people don't focus that much, for example, on whether they think police officers are good crime fighters and, you know, whether crime has gone down. They focus on these other four factors that, um, that I've spoken about. Those are the things that matter to people. And legal authorities can actually use these ideas to develop strategies um, for promoting compliance. And, you know, I've done some of that in Chicago, as you suggested. Okay, let me let me just summarize quickly, see if I'm we're on the same page. Okay, so there are sort of three main reasons why people might obey the law. One, because morality, they're, they think it's the right thing to do. Another, because of... Um, legitimacy they they believe the uh, government has a um, a, uh, a right to uh, tell them what to do and then uh, finally because of deterrence they fear what would happen to them if they don't obey uh, and they are listed in that order of significance uh, the government can't do much about morality but it can in the way it conducts its policing and uh, law enforcement do a lot about uh, legitimacy and about deterrence uh, your reading of the research suggests that there's um, opportunity to enhance security by being more attentive to legitimacy. Studies of the behavior of people, where does legitimacy come from, finds that 
if they're treated with dignity and respect, if they have a right to say something about what's going on with them and their side of the story, uh, if they feel that the processes with which they are being treated are fair, uh, then they are more likely to regard the government's uh, telling them what to do as something that the government has a right to do, and hence they're more likely to comply. Yeah, that was a very good summary. Oh, good, good. Okay, so we've got, <laughs> and now with respect to what that implies, well, over-incarceration is a bad thing. Uh, uh, belligerent policing is a bad thing. The war on drugs is a bad thing? I mean that to be a question uh, because that was, okay, I'll confess it, one area of behavior where, frankly, uh, and I'm a law abider, I want everyone to know that, I don't think the government has a right to tell me what molecules in the privacy of my home and, uh, you know, on my own account I ingest into my body in which I do not. And yet we have a far-flung uh, criminal sanction uh, being uh, administered uh, based on the government trying to tell people what to do. Is that, you know, a, a prime illustration of, you know, like pol law enforcement policy that squanders the opportunity to, to build legitimacy by trying to tell people something that people don't think the government has a right to tell them to do? Yeah. Um, so what's, what's interesting about that, I think, is, you know, most of, of my research is more focused on um, you know, particular, the, the ways in which particular kinds of encounters play out, uh -huh. um, regardless of whether the, the, what the, the law is per se. Um, although I will say, um, my colleague Tom Tyler and others have done research on particular kinds of laws, three strikes you're out. Um, you know, there, is, there are assessments of um, abortion laws. Um, I can't think offhand um, about uh, offhand about whether there are any particular research is it whether there's any particular research about um, drug laws, although I'm sure there is. But I can say something about my own research on that, okay. which is um, I did an analysis a long time ago of the General Social Survey and looking at a combination of attitudes. Uh, about legalization of marijuana on the on the one hand, and whether courts should be more harsh. That's the question in the GSS in your local area. Should courts be more harsh in your local area hmm. on offenders? It's, and if you put that together in a two by two, you get four positions, right? You get um, marijuana should be illegal and courts should be more harsh. Um, I call that the law enforcement cheerleader position. <laughs> You, you get court should be less harsh and marijuana should be legal. Um, you know, I call that anti-law enforcement. You have an other two other positions on the off-diagonal, which is um, court sh should be more harsh and marijuana should be legal. I call those the, the libertarians. And, and, and it's not technically a libertarian position, but yeah. it, the idea is that, you know, you do sanction uh, state intervention in the cases of force or fraud only, right? Then um, you don't want drugs to be illegal. And there's this last position, which is court should be less harsh, um, but marijuana should be illegal. And I call that dual frustration. And one of the things that was incredibly interesting is that if you looked at the demographics of where people fell along these four positions, African American women were disproportionately represented in the dual frustration category hmm. as compared to the others. And so, you know, what does that say? Well, people use law for all kinds of things, and they can recognize that, uh, and, and I think this gets to your point, that, you know, there are all sorts of negative things that the state is doing by, you know, punishing people for drug law violations or just for violations in general. Hence, they think court should be less harsh. People should be punished, but maybe not as harshly. But yet, you know, marijuana should still be illegal. And the only thing that I could come up with there is that these uh, could be people who are using the existence of criminal law as a, a way of helping them to set norms in their own communities. You know, they worry about the fact that if, you know, their children had easy access to marijuana, 
that, um, you know, life could be worse for them. This is akin to, I'm sure you've heard these stories, some parents telling their kids, I'm going to send you to juvie, yeah. you know, if you don't, so, right? No, it, it, it's not necessarily the kind of strategy we advocate or think is a good idea, especially when the consequences can be so negative, but you can understand the motivation. I would guess that some of those people go to uh, Christian churches and low-income minority neighborhoods in American cities and are relatively conservative in terms of, uh, I don't know, cultural values or something like that, but still think that there are too many too many young minority kids in prison. Exactly. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about race. Uh, we're already 30 minutes into this conversation and it <laughs> hasn't come up. Uh, that seems a pity. Uh, how, how in this uh, schema of thinking about the, the deep structure of uh, people's compliance with uh, order maintaining law. Uh, how does uh, race uh, factor in into the research program and, you know, and, and into your own thinking? Yeah, so a, a slight correction, my friend Glenn. I just mentioned in this last research okay. study that African American women were disproportionately I stand uh, represented in that that one category. So here's one of the other factors about why I turned to the social psychology, which is so interesting in the context of policing. One thing is clear is that um, you know crime has been dropping um, uh, precipitously across the country. Um, for the last three decades, pretty much. I mean, even in cities where the perception, the public perception is that, is that crime is uh, really bad, violent crime in particular, um, a place like Chicago, let's say, yeah. in contrast to a place like New York, it is still true that right now, uh, violence uh, in Chicago, the, the homicide rate is at its lowest levels, you know, since the early 60s. It's, it's much, much lower than it's been in decades. But what's fascinating is if you actually look at public support for police, what you find is that public support during the same time period while crime has fallen precipitously, public support has remained flat. Not only that, um, there is a gap with respect to public support, there's a race gap of something like 20 to 30 points. I'm pretty sure that's that's the number. Um, with um, people of color and African Americans in particular um, finding much or registering much less support for police than whites in a context in which crime is dropping substantially. Now, given our earlier conversation, about race and crime, you know, the places, so we didn't mention race specifically when we were talking about that, but, yeah. you know, if you look at um, the places where crime is now and was then highest, these are places that are disproportionately minority in big cities, um, like Chicago, almost all black. Um, and these are the people who are technically reaping the benefit Yep. of these lower crime rates, and yet, um, you know, their support has remained flat during this time period, and much, much lower than the support that whites offer the police. And so the, there's this question about what gives, I mean, and I think in these issues of procedural justice and, and legitimacy are really important to understanding that dynamic that is, you know, people are not going to automatically support the police just because the police are contributing to this outcome. And I'm not going to say that police are responsible entirely uh, for this crime job. You know, no one can say that. But I think it's fair to say that they have played a pretty substantial role. Um, but, you know, I think the public's view is we're not willing to accept a by any means necessary approach to uh, achieving lower crime rates. Well, are they justified in doing so? And I ask this as a genuine question without having a prefixed idea. I mean, uh, if, if the rhetoric uh, from uh, leadership and prominent uh, uh, respected parties within minority communities were more pro-police, uh, might that uh, be helpful in um, engendering in communities an appreciation <laughs> of what benefits they are uh, reaping uh, from policing or, or 
uh, is it that while these benefits are being generated, they're being generated with a cost that's borne disproportionately by innocent or law-abiding members of communities of color so that, you know, you know, I'm not supposed to believe my own lying eyes as a person in the community. I know that I've been stopped and I've been frisked. I know that my kid has been hassled or I know that the policeman was impolite or worse, uh, you know, was was pushing me around or, or whatever. Or, you know, I sat on the stoop and watched the kid get beat up by the cop for no good reason or whatever. I mean, what's the objective reality of the experience of people in these communities vis-a-vis the police? Is it accurately captured by, you know, the um, anti-police rhetoric that we hear from some uh, prominent members of minority communities, intellectuals and and, uh, public leaders. Yeah, not, um, you know, I think I can just imagine some of the people that you have in mind. Um, I do think there's a, a great variation in what, you know, public leaders are saying. So if you take someone like Michael Nutter, who's mayor of Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, he is yeah. very straightforward about being in favor of public safety, you know, but also, you know, very clear about, you know, the standards to which he expects, uh, you know, the, the police agency to meet or, you know, someone like the, the mayor of Sacramento, um, I think, it, Kevin Johnson, is also quite yeah. clear about that. Former um, basketball you know, player, can, is he not? Uh, really? <laughs> now I, believe, I'm, I'm, I believe he uh, is, actually, but I could be wrong about that. But never mind. Okay. And yeah, I, and I've heard I, some I actually, of Michael Nutter's speeches given in uh, black churches where he's, you know, he's he's made an impression on me. Yeah, and I, but I'm sure other people are, you know, are much more strident. And I agree that, um, you know, that, that that's unfortunate. But, you know, here's... Here's the reality. Um, if you looking at a place like New York, which I want to point out before I, I say any more, um, New York is is n- polices very differently from almost any other city in the country, and it is because there are so many police officers and um, a relatively small footprint, right? So if you look at density of police officers, they can achieve a a density per person per square foot that basically no other place can. And and that actually affects the experience that people, uh, you know, talk about. Let me make sure I'm following you. New York, I just want to make sure I understand. New York is more intensively policed than any other big city in the country. Is that what you just said? I want to be clear that they that there are two ways of measuring that. Yes. Certainly, in terms of the you know the stops, um, uh, the number of stops. I think that's right uh, per capita. But certainly, just if you look at the number of police officers that um, and sort of people and um, geography, they have a capacity that other places don't. Um, you know, Los Angeles has fewer police officers than Chicago. And has a larger population and a much bigger space. Um, space. I, so just kind of comparing that kind of thing. So what's the, any, yeah? Go ahead. I mean, why do you why do you mention that? Yeah. So I mention that because you know when you look at the which New York, which the New York Police Department is not doing any longer, um, but you know the the strategy that yeah. led to the litigation. You know there were places where people were especially young African-American men, were stopped again and again and again. I, my colleague Jeff Fagan did an estimate that uh, showed that something like young men between the ages of you know, 15 and 25 um, in certain areas of New York, if you did a distribution of um, the stops over you know, that group of people, he estimated that 90% of the young African American men in certain areas of the city were stopped. Now, given the legal standard that authorizes a stop, which is a police officer is only allowed constitutionally to stop someone when that officer has reasonable suspicion to believe that a person has engaged or is about to engage in a crime, it kind of, <laughs> it's, it's simply hard to believe yeah. that almost 100% of an entire demographic group is engaging in that kind of behavior. Well, it, a point of personal privilege, I lived in New York 2010-2011 while visiting at Columbia University. 
And I was stopped uh, in my 60s with a Ph.D. trying to simply get from my apartment to my office in Morningside Heights for riding my bicycle on the sidewalk. And I was issued a citation requiring me to appear in lower Manhattan uh, for this offense. So, you know, um, I, I, you know, reasonably engaged to a suspicion of engagement in law breaking. Well, I guess there's an ordinance against riding your bicycle on the sidewalk. And I guess the hundred feet from my doorstep to the curb at the end of the block was enough sidewalk, sidewalk riding to justify my being stopped. But it, it really felt like harassment to me. Yeah, I think those kinds of violations actually don't <laughs> support a stop. So I said engaged in a crime, actually. But, you know, it's that kind of thing that, you know, supports the sense that police are not behaving fairly. Let's get back to our factors. Yep. Right? Um, that they're not making decisions that are fair. Uh, especially when those decisions are disproportionately visited on one group de demographically, that gets back to our issue of race, and you add it up, you add to that work of ethnographers such as Rod Brunson and Jacinta Gao and others have shown that often when police are having these encounters with young people, they are extremely rude, and so even if they do have technically a legal right to stop someone when you are rude and disrespectful, that fuels this disengagement, um, a lack of a perception of legitimacy, and all of these things uh, lead to lower levels of public support for police. So what do you make of the uh, hands up, don't shoot uh, movement, um, if we can call it that? Uh, what do you make, I should say, of the large scale mobilization that has occurred around the country people stopping traffic on interstate highways and uh, engaging in uh, other behaviors uh, as a way of expressing uh, their uh, unhappiness with uh, police and practices um, of the general uh, concern that uh, the police in minority communities are, um, you know, behaving in ways that are acting with impunity. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm interested in your informed opinion about uh, kind of where we're going uh, with this. Um, and, you know. Well, I, I, I think that the, the protests um, indicate that we are at an important moment for, you know, understanding the relationship that police have with community. You know, the idea that a police officer is perceived as believing that he or she can literally do anything to another individual. I'm not saying that all police officers believe that, but there is this perception um, that that um, that they are not actually subject to law. Uh, I think is a, an aspect of you know these issues that I and others have been researching for so long. You know, I want to go. I, I, I want to just add one thing to the way you were describing it, which is about, you know, people being upset about policing. I think that's right, but, you know, one of the, the major sparks to these protests, of course, was the fact that in two cases, police officers who um, engaged in tactics that people, uh, many of the, the protesters believed, was um, was unlawful or were deemed not to be subject even to evaluation at trial. And I think, you know, for some people, the fact that uh, the police seem to be above the law in their view, right, um, is is what's fueling. I don't I don't police. know the facts here, and you yes. may. Are there cases where police officers are being punished for wrongful or you know negligent kind of shooting? Um, or other things. I mean, I hear oh, about yeah. the cases where they haven't been punished. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, are there not cases where they are being punished? And I don't hear so much about them. And so what's the, you know, what would be a fair description of the overall setting? Can a police officer, as an objective matter of fact, really expect to get away with doing just about anything? Yeah, I don't think so. No. Yeah, I wouldn't I mean, have thought there so. Are, yeah, there, there are cases, you know, there are cases, individual cases where police officers have shot um, uh, have shot people and have been subject, you know, to, to criminal prosecution. But, you know, more than that, the Justice Department is actively 
investigating policing agencies all over the country um, for, you know, for violations of, of individuals' civil rights. You know, the, the civil rights division, and there's a criminal division on the civil rights division, but they also have um, the possibility of engaging agencies in civil actions. And there are more of those than um, in this last decade than have, have ever taken place. I recently heard a, a talk by Vanita Gupta, who's the acting um, assistant attorney general for the civil rights division, yeah. um, talking about the activity. So, no, it, it, it's not fair to, to say that, that, I'm not saying that you were suggesting it, that, you know, that this is 19, you know, 45 or 55, you know, it's, it's a very different situation. That doesn't mean that, you know, people are not un understandably you know, upset about, sure. about these incidents. Let, let me ask you a question about policing that's been rattling around in my mind for a while. You uh, must have been aware that during the uh, march um, that took place in New York City um, after the uh, non-indictment in the Eric Garner and the uh, Michael Brown cases, shooting cases or, you know, police violence cases, that uh, some subset of the marchers were overheard saying something like, what do we want, dead cops, when do we want it now? Something like that wow. as a chant during the march. Now, I'm saying that not to indict them in any way, but to say this, and I want to get your reaction to it. There's a sense in which those of us who might advocate that the protocols governing the police's use of deadly force and when it would be justified and when it would not be, advocating that those protocol should be tightened or restricted. For example, that an officer patrolling a stairwell in a public housing project wouldn't be authorized to do so with his weapon drawn and ready to fire, but rather would be required to keep the weapon holstered and with the safety on when he goes into the stairwell and only draw the weapon should he actually encounter a threatening circumstance. Say, say one were to advocate that, that in a way what we really are saying, and I'm asking for your reaction to this, is we want more dead cops, quote unquote, saying it in the sense that we want rules governing police behavior to be restricted in such a way that the set of circumstances under which the police would be authorized to use force would be much narrower. That being the case, police would be in greater danger in a range of situations because they would be more reluctant to defend themselves because the protocols have been tightened. That being the case, there could be more instances where the police would be at a disadvantage tactically, and hence, at the end of the day, we'd end up with more dead cops because we wanted fewer dead civilians. Is is that is that trade off? I'm I'm trying to describe. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Pardon me. Um, I, is that yeah? Just, I think you're being. Yeah, go ahead. I asked I for your being, opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I think you are putting it in an unnecessarily provocative <laughs> way. Although I understand why you are doing it. Okay, so let me say first, I actually was not aware. Uh, of that, people saying, um, you know, what do we want more dead cops? What do we want it now? I, I've never heard of that until this moment. And um, wow, um, that is oh, you can go on YouTube. You can go on YouTube yeah. and find it. I'm not saying it was the I, whole march. Right. It was a no, group no, of I people understand. on a particular yeah. avenue. I mean, but so, but, yeah. but it's there. Yeah. It, it definitely happened. Yeah, the people are really. And, and by the way, it happened I mean, before so those. It happened before those two cops were shot. Yeah. Uh, in Brooklyn. <laughs> So here's the thing about the trend. Let me let me start off with a fact, and then um, you know, work my way to answering your question. Thank you. Um, so yes, people kill police officers yearly. Um, I can't tell you exactly what the number is um, in any given year. Yeah. Um, however, what I do know is that more police officers die from failing to wear their seatbelt every year yeah. than from having someone shoot them. Yeah. Okay. Now, in saying that, I am not suggesting that it is not a serious issue for a police officer to be um, faced with someone potentially shooting them. But... You know, understanding the risk of death, which is what we're talking about here in, in your job, right? 
Um, we know that police officers do a dangerous job. We value the fact that they are willing to do it to keep us safe, etc. Yep. Um, that police officers, this just points up the fact that police officers, I believe, need more training to understand the context of risk. Um, so, you know, you use an example of, of a police officer being in a stairwell and, and potentially believe, believing that he or she is potentially faced with a deadly situation when, in fact, the statistics suggest that he or she is not. And that's where work such as um, Jennifer Eberhardt's and Phil Goff's and others who do work on implicit bias are so helpful. We know that we all have biases, and these biases fuel the particular perception that you were talking about. How much at risk am I? Yeah. Um, and that uh, police officers need to learn that a lot of situations where they believe that they are at risk, in fact, the risk is lower, number one. Number two, the procedural justice literature and the kind of trainings that I have worked on help police to not only understand that there's a lower level of risk, but the kind of activities and behaviors they need to engage in to de-escalate situations so that they don't have to shoot people. Um, so that, in fact, when it comes time to think about pulling out a gun and shooting, you have already avoided that situation or you're in a position to use much less lethal technology, a taser, for example, rather than a gun, you know, which Darren Wilson was not wearing because it was uncomfortable or something. Um, you know, yeah. that also I helps thought he to, said, I mean, just on this, it's a very small point. I thought what he said in the testimony was that the taser was physically located next to the car door on one side of his body in a way that it wasn't easy for him to reach. Or something like that, but I could no, be wrong about have, the fact. He didn't have the taser with. He him. didn't have the taser, no, taser at all. No. I see. Okay. Right, and so you know the combination of making sure that people have officers have less lethal technologies, but also are trained in techniques of de-escalation and trained to understand that contexts really aren't as dangerous as they think. All of those things will keep officers safe in a way that we don't have to actually think about it in terms of the trade-off that you were posing. And they should just wear sheet belts. <laughs> Let me just say that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I got it. I think that's helpful. Listen, I, I think, you know, we've had a good conversation here and um, maybe it's time for us to do some real work this afternoon. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Thanks so much, Tracy, for doing this. I really appreciate it. And happy New Year. You too, bye.